So I'm back from my big weekend in Agra, and I think it just so much happened that I'm going to have to break this into separate blog posts. But um, before I get there, let me start with food this time instead of ending with food. Uh, I have a feeling kind of left out here. Great street food culture in India. Uh, you see it all over the place. It smells great. There's people lined up waiting to get things like samosas. Um, but uh, I'm being very careful about what and where I eat. And so far, I have not been sick. And I'm going to knock on wood here and say, hopefully I won't be if I'm really careful. Um, they treat us extremely well here at the Taj Ambassador. And one of the things that uh, the staff did as a, a sort of treat for the India Institute people is to put together some safe street food. So this is Pani Puri. Um, you start with a little fried puri bread that puffs up to make a hard shell that's hollow inside. And then normally what would happen is the guy on the street would just poke his finger in it. Of course, you know, you've got sanitation issues there. You can see to the left that our chef is wearing uh, not just uh, latex gloves, but nitrile gloves. He's poked a hole, put in garbanzo beans, a little potato, a little bit of the red chutney, and then uh, a sort of mint water, cold mint water that's iced, um, goes in there. And I, I can imagine that these things would just be amazing on the street. As you pop one in your mouth, you get the sort of explosion of cold, cold fluid. It's still, you know, it's, it's, it's not as hot as it has been, but we're still talking about, you know, high humidity and in the upper 80s. So that would be extremely refreshing. So I think I said last time that this was the part of the uh, India Institute that I was most excited about covering Mughal architecture. And on the Friday before we left for Agra, we visited um, what, in my opinion, uh, has been the, the most spectacular site so far in, uh, in Delhi, which is Humayun's tomb. And Humayun's tomb is uh, this absolutely amazing tomb with a double dome. You can see it's got the, the, the large outer dome up there, and then it's got a, uh, a sort of more um, familiar um, round dome on the inside. Um, this place is absolutely symmetrical, really wonderfully put together. Um, it sets within a garden, which is which also plays uh, to order and symmetry. And you can see here, there's a, a a use of water to both cool and then provide these amazing reflections. Um, simply fantastic. But the highlight of that part of the trip was that um, we were with. Uh, one of the the eminent scholars in the field, uh, Ebe Koch, and she uh, has written the book literally on the Taj Mahal. So to go get to see that with her was going to be fantastic. But she she knew the the gentleman in charge of the restoration project on Humayun's tomb, and so she was able to arrange for us to go up on the roof, which is normally closed to the public. Just <laughs> absolutely breathtaking. And you can see in the restoration project they've identified some of the colored tiles, um, particularly uh, the blue on the kiosks that you can see in front of you. Um, where the original tiles remain, they leave those in the sort of dyed out color that, that has happened, you know, over uh, you know, uh, over 400 years of wear and tear. And then where the tiles had fallen off, they've added the restoration tiles so that you can see what it would have looked at like at the time. Um, and because I was sticking around with her, even after everybody else had gone down, we had the chance actually, just because she asked, to uh, enter the, the top of the dome. So you can see to the left there, um, we're looking down on uh, Humayun Cenotaph. And um, so if you look to the right, that's at the ground level now. Um, typical of both Sultanate burials and uh, Mughal burials, you've got uh, a positioning of the body that pays attention to the direction of Mecca. And so the head is buried to the north, the, the body is placed on its side facing west, and here you can see that Mirab has actually been added to a beautiful marble screen um, so that it's not indeed a, a niche in the wall, um, but instead there is, there is this beautiful doorway of light. Um, on the way down to Agra, it rained, and it rained and it rained. There was actually floods in both Agra and uh, New Delhi. And there was a point where after we checked, in, checked into the hotel and we were way t on our way to uh, Fatapur Sikri, I thought we weren't going to make it. But our awesome driver, Mr. Singh, um, took us on what seemed like a boat ride uh, through the streets. Um, he was sending massive wakes with the, uh, with the bus. Um, 
Adults didn't seem too excited about this, but children seemed to love it. So to the left, that's the best picture I could get. There were kids standing to the side of the bus, and as the bus would splash, they would put their hands in the in the water and they would splash back, and I, they were laughing at us and pointing. And it was just, it was fun. It was it was a good time. We were waving back, taking pictures, um, and you can see them kind of gathered up on the right um, as we're rounding the corner. Fata Por Sikri uh, could not have worked out better for us. It rained for about the first um, 30 minutes that we were there, and then otherwise it seemed like we were the only people in the joint. Um, if you don't know Fata Por Sikri, it is a new capital that was built by Akbar. Um, it's outside of Agra, maybe, uh, you know, it. I can't imagine how long it would be by horse, but you know, if it's not flooded, it's it's a good 30 minutes outside of town at least. And it's built out of this beautiful red sandstone. Unfortunately, he only occupied it for a short period of time. Uh, but maybe that's not unfortunate because it leaves us a monument that's virtually untouched since and was kind of too far outside of uh, the normal town t for anybody to use it as a quarry to take stone out or to want to sort of reappropriate it and adapt it to their uses. Um, you know, up close, you can really see this gorgeous craftsmanship. And, um, you know, an interest in adding indigenous Indian types of designs, things that we, we wouldn't normally see in Islamic architecture, um, flowers, uh, abstracted figures of usually animals, not people, um, just absolutely gorgeous stuff. We also went to um, the Friday Mosque that is uh, built at the same time, also Akbar Construction, uh, just across the way. Um, the Fatapur Sikri uh, was a fairly expensive ticket to get in. Um, the uh, Jama Masjid was completely open to the public, so it, it was a night and day experience. Um, it is beautiful in its own right. As you can see, the mihrab on the, on the left, uh, it's in fairly good condition in certain parts, and it's extremely popular because it contains the uh, the tomb of Salim uh, uh, Chisti, or Chishti, uh, which is, uh, he is a Sufi saint who is, uh, who people go to make wishes at, at his, his tomb uh, to uh, in hopes of getting uh, a, a to become with a child, you know. So um, Akbar apparently was having trouble producing an heir, and uh, this is the Sufi saint who who blessed him, saying he would he would have indeed a son. And uh, ever since, uh, women have made this pilgrimage um, if they want to be with child. Um, it's a gorgeous little building inside uh, the the mosque, and it gives things a really different flavor. So um, uh, for those who aren't familiar. Um, Sufi uh, Sufi Muslims are uh, a little bit different in the way that uh, they pray. There is more music, there is more dancing. It's a more mystical sort of uh, approach to Islam. And so we saw some of that, and that was really wonderful, kind of a haunting sort of music. Um, but this is also open to the public. So we had uh, children at, who were trying to, to sell us goods, hawkers, people saying they were guides um, all over us the entire time. If you get off a bus with, you know, 24 people who are um, obviously not from the place, you will get a lot of attention. And so um, I was getting a lot of attention, uh, attention and, and here's a, a little guy who I gave a little money to, and, uh, and uh, the, the deal was he would stand for a picture for me. Um, and if you think it's kind of odd that... Uh, you know, India would have monuments open to the public where, you know, they're not cordoned off, they're not uh, necessarily, uh, you know, sort of under security and such. Um, I just want to point out how difficult it is for the, the Indian government, which has different sorts of struggles, you know, keeping the people fed and such, um, to deal with, and, and, and how much more difficult it is for them to, to contain uh, these, these monuments to keep them safe. So uh, to the left, the top of Humayun's tomb, this is... Uh, just a window that's open and you can see a plant has seeded and, and germinated and it is uh, just growing out of a crack in, uh, in, in between the stones. And of course over time if you let a plant like that grow it's going to cause damage. 
Well, this thing had been restored and recently cleaned within just a couple of years, and that's, that's how much attention uh, needs to be paid to these monuments if you want to keep them in pristine condition. Uh, on the right, this is from that, that Sunday, uh, or that, that Friday mosque, and uh, these, uh, this is a beehive that's growing up um, in one of the archways. There were actually several different beehives. Um, you know, with this much humidity, this many insects, uh, sort of aggressive plant life, it it's a it's a major problem, very very difficult for uh, for the archaeological survey around here to uh, to keep things in check. And uh, you know I have to put the Taj in the second of my uh, of of my blog posts, but um, so it's not too much of a teaser. I thought I would give you my first look at the Taj, which I visited the next morning, and I will cover in my next uh, blog post.